Everyone, and thank you for coming. I want to thank Bev Krebs and Bev Bean for helping us to have such a wonderful and healthy lunch and all of their hard work that goes into that. We were at it before that. Um, we have a great program today, and before we get started with that, I'd like to see if there are any guests or members who have brought guests that we could um, welcome you, have an introduction, and welcome you to our meeting. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, for all the shy people that uh, look like new faces, again, we thank you very much. And, and you can remain um, anonymous at this point, but we'll hope that you um, come often and will consider joining us. Um, just a couple of announcements. Um, any announcements from any of the members from the floor? Yes, Bev. Uh, tomorrow is the Natural Resources Committee meeting at noon at Mariposa Hall. Noon, Mariposa Hall. Tomorrow is this meeting for natural resources. Um, along with that, I will announce that um, next month is a special month for us because it's our annual meeting. Our meeting will be on Saturday. May 12th. So um, please be sure to put that on your calendar and come. Uh, we'll have an election of officers, of course, a review of our budget, and all kinds of important and wonderful things. So it'll, it'll be a great, plus we have a wonderful program for that one as well, and it's going to be on civil discourse. So we'll all know how to agree to disagree respectfully. So. With that, um, again, I want to thank you all for coming, and I'll turn the program over to um, Janet, who will introduce our speakers. Well, we are very fortunate to have two uh, members of the uh, staff of the Transportation Agency for Monterey County. Uh, one of our speakers, <coughs> Rich Steele, is eminent for being the major designer of the uh, Holman Highway Interchange Roundabout, uh, which has been so successful. Um, Rich is a principal engineer and uh, <coughs> for the Transportation Agency for Monterey County. Uh, Grant Leonard, uh, who will be doing the presentation, is a uh, transportation planner for the agency, and he specializes in highway planning, motorist assistance, and construction-related public outreach. He managed development of the Highway 68 corridor plan and currently manages the San Miguel Canyon Road corridor plan in North Monterey County and the County Regional Transportation Plan of 2018. He will be doing the presentation on the plan for Highway 68, which envisions a number of uh, roundabouts plus some very creative uh, ways to deal with uh, our wildlife uh, habitat and wildlife in the area. So Grant will do the presentation and then we'll have questions afterwards and both Rich and Grant will be a bit available to respond to questions. So Grant? Well, good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and to be presenting. I've uh, attended several of your meetings in the past, and uh, it's now my time to shine up here on camera. I appreciate that. Uh, so I'll be giving an overview of the uh, Highway 68 Scenic Highway Plan. That uh, was conducted from December of 2015 through August of 2017. And uh, we should be moving into some environmental review for the plan following uh, this fall, actually. And I'll get into that a little later. Yep. So I'll cut to the chase. This is where we ended up. This is a, a graphic of the preferred concept. In general, it looks at replacing a majority of the signals on Highway 68 between Salinas and Monterey with roundabouts. 
And so those blue dots and red dots are uh, proposed wildlife undercrossings along the highway. You see the, the way this was funded was through a Caltrans Sustainable Transportation <coughs> Planning Grant. And in addition to improving the roadway for us, the travelers, uh, we also had to find a way to improve it for the natural environment. Since Highway 68 borders the Fort Ord National Monument and uh, Sierra de Salinas Mountains, on the other side, there's a lot of wildlife that cross in between um, the two and over the highway, and uh, that can be a problem for the wildlife, can be a problem for us, the drivers. Uh, it's quite a serious incident if you ever run into a deer or a mountain lion. Um, so it's a safety issue as well as an environmental issue. And what we found um, is that there were opportunities to put in undercrossings for wildlife to cross. And I'll get into that in a little bit as well. So a few other points about this. We were working on a corridor that involves an airport, a nationally known, world-renowned racetrack, several schools, and uh, several proposed developments as well. So we had to coordinate our efforts with all the other planning efforts that were going on, uh, including an update to the airport's master plan, as well as to the Farini Ranch subdivision near Toro Park, which has been approved by the county. It has an approved uh, transportation mitigation plan, but is also in court and is being litigated by, uh, I think, two parties. And so we were planning um, in uh, coordination with litigation, which is an interesting, uh, <laughs> it's an interesting process to go through. But our final plan uh, respects the approved and adopted plan by the County of Monterey for Farini Ranch. And it also considers some additional widening for uh, Highway 68 between San Bonancio and Corral. Um, that's to be studied later on in the environmental document. But essentially, uh, Corral and San Bonancio are so close to each other, um, and it's not, uh, not too long a distance that you could widen between that, and it might help the function of the two roundabouts there. Um, also, Laguna Seca Racetrack was very interested in improving their access. Um, currently, they're not at Morales Grade, they're just a little west of Morales Grade, and they have to use South Boundary Road to get in and out a lot for major events. So if we could find a way to improve access for them, uh, they would greatly appreciate it, as would the SPCA on the other side of the road. Uh, and the total cost for our proposed plan was $81 million. Uh, a quick note on funding. In 2016, our agency uh, successfully passed a sales tax measure. Uh, it's three-eighths of a penny. And it will fund transportation in Monterey County to the tune of about $20 million a year for 30 years. So $600 million. Of that, uh, $50 million was dedicated to this section of Highway 68. So we have a dedicated funding source to work with uh, to chip away at that $80 million estimate. Uh, the other big thing that happened in 2017, as we were wrapping up our project, is the state passed a gas tax, diesel tax uh, increase, among other fee increases, uh, generally called Senate Bill 1, Rebuilding California. And that generates $5 billion a year for transportation throughout the state. And we can use our local funds to go after competitive grants through that state program. And so these are the two main funding sources we're looking at for Highway 68. A bit of a uh, note on process. Uh, I'm a planner, so my uh, only product I produce is process. Uh, <laughs> And these are some of the processes we went through. Um, we looked at the intersections along the road. We looked at the segments of road between the intersections. We evaluate how those two function independently and how they evaluate or uh, function together. Multimodal operations, that means bicyclists and pedestrians. It's a very popular route for uh, uh, road cyclists, not so much for the casual commuter or the family, but um, there's a dedicated biking community in Monterey County that uses the road and also some potential for pedestrians at the intersections, particularly crossing, crossing the road, say, to get to the bus stops. We looked at safety and um, how reliable the road is. One of the key takeaways from the study is that it's a very unreliable road. It's one lane in each direction, and if there's an accident, um, then the whole thing gets gummed up. 
or if a traffic light goes out, um, then everybody stop. And that may happen one day, it may not happen the next. So a commute for you might take 40 minutes one day, it might take an hour and a half the next. It's very unreliable, and, uh, and that's not what we like to see in our roads. It's also hard to get quality uh, bus service on a road that's not reliable, because if the bus is supposed to show up at 10 a.m. and they can't rely on it being there at 10 a.m., then they can't provide that service. Uh, we also looked at reducing emissions, uh, putting better air quality for the highway. Uh, generally speaking, congestion leads to more idling and uh, more stopping and going, and that causes more emissions to be uh, emitted into the environment. A general performance summary, and of course our wildlife connectivity analysis. And I do have a few slides on it. We also did two rounds of public outreach. Uh, so in the spring of 2016 and then in the, the summer of 2017, first to sort of gauge what people thought were the problems with the road. Uh, we had a, a website and a map and people could literally drop a comment on the map for where they saw an issue. And we used that to inform our technical work and then uh, come up with our proposed solutions. And then the second round of outreach was on those proposed solutions. So we came up with uh, three concepts that we thought were uh, reasonable, that were fundable, um, and that could be built in the near term, five to ten years. Uh, we wanted to have a study that could be implemented quickly and not just sit on a shelf. So the first concept was um, just roundabouts, improving those intersections. Um, second one was roundabouts with about six miles of widening, but in different segments. So instead of widening the whole road, we looked at a few choice segments that could be uh, reasonably built within our budget and also would have a limited environmental impact compared to widening the whole road. And the third one was to improve the existing signals uh, through the use of an adaptive signal system, which is a, a fancy term for a computer system that gets the signals to talk to each other and proactively react to, uh, to traffic. And so you, one light will talk to the next light, and that light will talk to the next light, and then they can sort of meter the flow of traffic a little better. And we compared these on some very basic uh, ideas. Safety, which one's going to improve the road most for safety? Which is going to reduce delay the most? Uh, what's going to have the least environmental impact? Uh, how are you going to operate and maintain the road over the next 20, 30, 50 years? Uh, there's a cost to maintaining whatever you build, so we have to consider that. Cost to build it, and then how the public generally uh, um, reacted to the concepts when we did our public outreach. And so, uh, traditional color scheme, green is good, red is bad, yellow is in the middle. Uh, you can see the first option had the most green. Um, best results for safety, the environment, operation, and uh, public output or in, input. Uh, the widening had a little better results for delay just because there was more road lanes for people to travel so they could save a little bit of more time. But uh, it was considerably more of an impact to the environment and to the cost to build it and to maintain it. And really the only advantage of the third option was the cost. It was the lowest cost of all. But uh, signals are expensive to maintain and operate over the long term. And we also had to widen out some of the intersections to make the improved signal system work. So there were environmental impacts and also uh, some cost implications to that. So uh, the cost was not considerably less than the first option. It was less though. So for the preferred concept, uh, this is a graph that shows delay. So if you're traveling from Salinas to Monterey or vice versa, how long are you expected to be in delay during uh, the commute times? So in the morning, 7 a.m. to 9, in the evening, 3 p.m. to 7. Uh, the gray bar here shows what the existing delay is for people. Uh, this one, the second line, shows uh, what improving the signals would do. And the third option was our preferred choice in the roundabouts. So it, uh, it was pretty pretty clear cut that it would all, not only improve what it is today, but it would be better than the other options as well. 
Uh, some of the concepts that we looked at but were not selected for more study was the four-door bypass. Uh, this would be a new four-lane uh, freeway highway through four-door from Toro Park to the Canyon Del Rey interchange. And Caltrans had originally requested a portion of the four-door be set aside for this when it was decommissioned. But the land was never deeded to Caltrans. It was just a, a plan line. Not, uh, no land was officially transferred. So in 2012, when it became a national monument, that uh, plan line uh, became a, a crown gem for the, our national monument system. And it was very hard to build a new freeway through a national monument. <laughs> Um, full widening, uh, you could imagine the cost of widening from Highway 1 uh, to where it's currently four lanes at Canyon Del Rey with all the homes. And then likewise from York Road all the way to S Toro Park. Uh, it's quite a bit of an impact, quite a bit of expense, uh, quite a bit of anticipated public opposition as well. A reversible lane is the idea of putting one third lane down the middle of the road and it changes with uh, commute traffic. Uh, that has a lot of operational costs to maintain that, to operate it every day for the road. You also need a considerable split in daily traffic, somewhere around 70% this way and 30% that way. And what we saw on Highway 68 is it was closer to uh, 45, 55. And so although it seems like it's a profound split when you're in traffic, uh, the numbers just didn't pan out to, to show that. So it wasn't a feasible uh, alternative to pursue further. The last three are, uh, again, large infrastructure improvements. They would have uh, the first one and the second one would be a bypass from Toro Park to Corral de Tierra. Would also encroach on the National Monument and would have a few one small interchange or up to two small interchanges to make it work with the existing Highway 68 being a frontage road. Uh, again, budget wise, those interchanges would be more than what's feasible. It would also be just one section of the road would be improved, the rest of the road towards Monterey would not. And you do have environmental considerations and the Florida National Monument. And the third one was just to have every signal that's out there now be converted into a small interchange similar to the parkway uh, schemes you see in New York or New Jersey. Um, again, the idea of 10 new small interchanges on Highway 68 uh, was not feasible to pursue. But we did recognize them, we did document them. Would you clarify that? You said it's in New York. What, what does that mean specifically? What does that look like? So it would, um, traveling down Highway 68, you would have no stops, but you would have off ramps, and then you'd go under or over, and then you'd uh, access Corral or San Nancy or Lorellis. Um, so it would help for throughput, no question. It's just a matter of the cost of building uh, that number of interchanges, and, and you also get into consideration of the character of the road. What would that do to Highway 68 that we have now? Um, it would be a big change. So for wildlife connections, this is a deer taking a selfie. <laughs> this is actually uh, across from the golf course near Boots Road. And it is at 7.15 in the morning on a commute day. And he's out grazing. And if he were to decide to cross the road, um, it would be a, a very unfortunate thing for him and for all the commuters that morning. And this happened at what we call our hotspot for animal collisions. Uh, we noted an unusually high amount of fatalities for deer and car accidents with animals at that location. And it just so happens it's on top of a drainage culvert that uh, water flows through and the deer like to follow water. And so they all come to this location but the pipe is too small and too full of dirt for the deer to go through. And so they then go up and over the road. So if that pipe were improved, uh, they could simply cross under it. And the idea behind that uh, is something like this. This is from Colorado. Uh, this is also very similar to the uh, Toro Creek undercrossing at uh, San Manancio. So as you leave San Manancio towards Salinas, you actually go over a bridge 
that looks a lot like this. And if you go under it, you'll see a lot of wildlife tracks. And uh, our camera captured a lot of wildlife going under that road. So that's a good example of where the animals had a safe way to, to get across the road compared to our hotspot. So we wanted to install a variety of improvements, uh, this being the largest type along the corridor, 10 different locations. Some of them would just be this type of directional fencing that could guide the animals to where there's already a pipe big enough for them to go through. Uh, other locations would be a, a bigger pipe like this. But uh, the big thing we got was why so many roundabouts? Aren't nine or ten in a row? Isn't that a little excessive? Uh, you know, did you guys have a discount? In <laughs> Well, I'll go back to this. One thing to keep in mind is it is a series of signalized intersections, right? And so the traffic lights control traffic and allow you to go this way or that way. And we all wait our turn politely and then we go forward. Um, that also leads to a lot of people not paying attention and crashing into the car that stopped at the light in front of them. And you have a lot of rear end accidents on Highway 68. You also have just a lot of congestion that results from that. So if you take the idea that we're just controlling traffic as it already is controlled, the roundabout is just a different way of controlling it, a way that, a way that has been endorsed for a number of reasons, uh, including safety and emission benefits. The uh, Federal Highway Administration has endorsed it, as has Caltrans. Caltrans actually mandates that you consider a roundabout option whenever you're looking at improving one of their intersections. It's widely used uh, in other states and in California. And so it's been endorsed by the American Association of Retired People and AAA. <laughs> and this last really acronym one is um, our technical workbook that we go to when we do traffic analysis. And that is uh, the technical world that Rich and I live in have also endorsed it. So nationwide, uh, <coughs> Over 4,000 roundabout intersections so far. This is from uh, a consultant website. Um, you can visit this and you can zoom in on the individual locations. And uh, Holman Highway is on the map as the roundabouts in Marina. But you see, they work in Wisconsin where it's snowy, they work in Florida where it's not. Uh, they work in Washington and Kansas and Colorado. And actually, California is in the top 10 states in terms of total number of roundabouts. And then they're peppered up and down the East Coast. So um, perhaps it's new to us, but it's not a new, new technology or a new way of monitoring traffic. I talked briefly about safety, but um, in general, overall collisions will go down 40% is what's been noted nationally. Uh, injury collisions go down by 75% and fatalities by 90%. Uh, again, that's from those 4,000 intersections that have been studied. And then pedestrian collisions go down by about 40%. So this is a dramatic improvement for safety. We had some concern about emergency vehicles on Highway 68. There is a fire station at Toro Park and Morales Grade. Uh, it's the main route for residents who live there to get to Community Hospital or to Salinas Valley. And what we like to show about this picture is it's a fire station at an intersection where the driveway of the fire station actually enters the roundabout. And this is in Chico, Northern California. And uh, on a previous version of this, we had a quote from the fire chief talking about how easy it is for his trucks to come in and out, even during commute time. Also of note is the roundabout is two lanes all around, uh, which is the same uh, style roundabout we're proposing for 68. So if there's traffic, they can move to the right or to the left, they can clear a lane, and that allows an emergency vehicle to go through the intersection quite quickly. Um, if you happen to be in traffic last week on Highway 68, one of the reasons on one of the days was one of the traffic lights went out, it malfunctioned. And when that happens, it blinks red and it acts like a stop sign. Uh, the same for when the power goes out. 
But in the case of a roundabout, there is not that electrical reliance. Um, there's not that potential for a malfunction. So you get a more reliable road uh, by taking out that, uh, that potential. And we have a simulation. Uh, for Highway 68 at 218, Canyon Hill Ray. Sure, I'll talk about this one. Um, this is an interesting intersection because I rebuilt this as a traffic signal when I widened Highway 68 to put in the Ragsdale signal. And we did it to serve traffic all the way till 2020. Well, here we are, 2018. <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny? But, um, it was designed to move more traffic and the way signal does that is you add more lanes. Well, I had added a half mile of four lane widening in order to make this signal and the Ragsdale signal work. This roundabout solution works and serves more traffic than the existing traffic signal does. And it's one of the harder concepts to get, but why do you move more traffic in a roundabout than a traffic signal? Well, the roundabout doesn't stop everyone. You don't share this teeny little box in the middle of the intersection in a roundabout. But you do in a traffic circle or a traffic signal. And that's why everybody has to take turns, because there's that little teeny space in the middle that everybody has to basically drive over. You can see the space here. See all the all the oil spots and everything? That's where it is. Well, if you take out that spot, then now people blend into the roundabout, which has a larger circulatory um, length and area, so people blend in. The other piece that um, makes the volume work better, or increases the capacity, is in a roundabout, people are driving slower, 20 miles an hour. Just like the roundabout you went through at home and highway, it's designed to slow every car down to about 20 miles an hour on entry, which is about the same speed as the circulating traffic. It means everybody's going the same speed, slow. They're not stopped or accelerating, which seems to be the two things that a traffic signal, right? You got a red light, and you're driving up to the back of the queue, and you stop. The light turns green, and you accelerate. What happens when the light turns yellow? You accelerate more, right? <laughs> You're trying to get through. <laughs> so that speed differential is one of the things that makes safety at a traffic signal so precarious. And I've been doing traffic engineering for 33 years. And the day I started, there was all kinds of discussions in the industry of how do we make the yellow interval the right length? How do you make that yellow long enough so you can get through before it turns red, but short enough so that four people behind you don't go through right behind you. And it's never changed. The discussions have gone on and on and on to where you know that yellow interval is measured in tenths of a second. Right? Does it make any difference? No. My kids, I love my kids dearly, they'll follow the fifth car through. Right? <laughs> So why would you want the highest speed through the intersection to be the place where you have the highest probability of cross traffic driving right in front of you? That's why the um, accidents drop with roundabouts, because we're bringing everybody to the same speed, slow, and everybody's blending in and moving. What are the advantages in Europe of uh, another yellow light before green? They probably have the same problem I do with my kids. Oh, okay, don't show you know. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I was just being facetious. Um, roundabouts are used much more frequently in Europe, uh, and they've had success with them for ever, never, never, never. Although the roundabout technology has advanced dramatically in the last ten years, um, we're doing a lot more with. Let's go back to that one sketch. The simulation. Just a second, please. 
So one of the things that has made roundabouts work a lot better lately is um, these splitter islands. So they're designed to essentially deflect traffic ahead of the intersection so you drive slower. It's not a dramatic thing, but it's soft and gentle and it feels comfortable to drive slower on your approach. So you get slower speeds as we're driving in and it's more comfortable. Just like the split islands we have on home and highway. <coughs> By dropping the speed, when you get to this place here, you really are only going 20 miles an hour and the circulating speed is 20 miles an hour, so you're choosing between one conflict right there. You look left, is it clear? Yes, enter. Is it no? Yield, going behind it. Wait two cars, wait three cars, going behind it. And because the interaction is smooth and simple, and it's really driver to driver, you know, you look and you see, and sometimes you'll make eye contact. Well, that driver-to-driver -driver interaction on the cross street doesn't happen at a traffic signal, does it? No, what you see is this blur. <laughs> so that's what, that's what makes this so much safer, is this interaction right here. This guy and this guy. Whether they're going ahead of him or behind him. What happens if there's a little confusion and the guy in the center stops? It's okay. You know, maybe you burn a couple of seconds. It's all right. You didn't wreck your car, right? You just keep going. It's okay. Okay, so that's, that's one of the key pieces. The second piece is, um, this is really a, a two-lane rural highway. It's a two-lane rural highway. When you take a single approach lane and you split it into two and give them the opportunity to glide through slowly, you have more capacity. It's like you make the pipe bigger at the intersection. So essentially, it's opposite from uh, traffic signals on a two-lane rural highway. If I want to increase the capacity of the signal, I have to add more and more through lanes. Here, well, you can just visualize it here. The node is wide and the roads are narrow. With the signals, it's opposite. The roads are wide and the nodes are narrow. It's much different. I actually use less pavement with a roundabout than I, that has the same capacity as a signal because the signal has to have lots and lots of acreage for storing cars before they get their green and yellow and all that stuff. So this is, this is a photo before uh, we finished building that roundabout. This is before we built the roundabout. And is that your car, Jan? <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, raise your hand if you got stuck in that one mile queue coming out of the Pacific Road. I remember how horrible that was, how frustrating. Remember that one guy that would zip in in front of you coming out of Carmel Hills Professional Center? Wouldn't wait his turn? That's gone. There used to be this 12 to 15 car queue inside the Carmel Hills Professional Center. Now there's no queue. No queue. If you, and, okay, so here's the here's the roundabout running. The volume is the same. It actually increased slightly because we got some diversion from Lighthouse Avenue. But the volume's the same as what it was in the traffic circle or in the traffic signal. It's the exact same volume. High ramp exit volume. Lots of folks coming out of Pebble Beach. Here's Pebble Beach down here. Here's the southbound exit ramp. Everybody going toward uh, the hospital. And here's that long one mile queue. Oh, where it used to be coming out of Pacific Grove. And it's just gone. Everybody's driving 20. It's smooth. It's intuitive. It makes sense. So as we look at this solution applied toward each signal on Highway 68. The question is, which signal do you like on Highway 68 that you want to keep <laughs> and don't want to do this, right? Which one do you want to keep? Because we got a lot to build. We're happy to keep the ones that you like and only do the ones where we really need them. <laughs> I, 
heard Mary Adams speak uh, recently, and she said that the county was thinking about putting a roundabout at the intersection of Carmel Valley Road and Morales Grade. Yes. So to me, I can understand your point and your reasoning here, but to me, it's not an ongoing problem. If you had those smart uh, stoplights, it would be green most of the time on Carmel Valley Road, and then there would, when there was a backup on the grade, it would turn. And so that, to me, doesn't sound like a logical solution for that problem. <clears throat> How fast is Carmel Valley Road? 45, 55. <clears throat> How far? How fast do you really drive it? <laughs> okay. Forty-five twenty-five. Okay, good. I like you guys. You drive nice. <laughs> so, a roundabout is just a different way to control the same intersection. Roundabouts do not apply to every single intersection. It's not something where you take it and go, "Oh, this, we're just going to do roundabouts from now on." forever. <clears throat> However, when you have higher speed applications where there's a lot of left turns from a side street like Lorella's Grade, roundabouts tend to be far safer because of the speed and everything else. But you're not stopping, completely stopping the flow on the major street which generates the queuing, right? You're blending. So, could it work at Lorella's grade? A roundabout could work at Lorella's grade. Would a signal work there? Yeah, I can make a signal work there. By the way, I'm a, I started out as a signal designer. Designed over 600 traffic signals all over the place. Everywhere. LA, Orange County, Ventura, San Bernardino, San Diego, everywhere. And I've done a lot of them in Monterey. So I know how to make them work. And yes, you could do a signal at Lorella's grade. Would it be the best option? I'm not sure. Um, that's one of the reasons Caltrans now requires an intersection control evaluation because it compares a traffic signal to a roundabout at each specific location. So before that roundabout is really improved at Lorellis and um, Carmen Valley Road, there should be, the county will do an intersection control evaluation that will really compare those and see which one works better. Uh, a great example of locations where roundabouts don't work so well. Downtown Monterey, right in front of the conference center. I just got done doing that signal there and one at um, Timon Pacific. And the pedestrian volume is so high that essentially that intersection would just be gridlocked with pedestrians just because it's so high. So the signal does a better job of assigning right away, protecting the pedestrians and moving traffic. Yes, ma'am. As you can see, there are crosswalks not there. Yep. I've never yet seen anyone walking in it, but I've been very that someone might. How will I know that there's going to be a pedestrian crossing in front of me? Well, that's the other good thing. Um, and I have seen pedestrians here. During construction, there was a couple homeless guys that needed to get medicine at the hospital. <laughs> So they were walking through. But these were very deliberately designed so that on, on the approach, you can see this car crossing this crosswalk. On the approach, the yield condition where the driver is going to make contact with the conflicting movement here is after the crosswalk. So we drop the speed before the crosswalk. And then the control is after, the decision is after. The driver is only looking at one conflict at a time. First, you see the crosswalk and the pedestrian. Then you get to the yield point, and you can make that interaction. What happens at a signal? It's all right there. Two different crosswalks, cross traffic, everything is right there. There's actually 32 conflict points in a traffic signalized intersection, which is interesting. Do you um, want to take questions now, or do you want to complete your presentation? Do I have any questions? We have just a few more slides. So okay, let's hold our questions till the end. So just two more slides. Uh, this one's about public attitude. Uh, so the dark green on the left is very negative, and also before a roundabout is built, uh, people are skeptical, they're hesitant, they don't tend to like it. And then the lighter green on the, the right-hand side is positive and very positive. And you see it's polar opposite. Uh, 
And that again is from our national surveys from those 4,000 roundabouts we talked about. And I think we've relived this graph right here on Monterey Peninsula with the Home and Highway Project where people were skeptical and now, uh, now it's getting all positive reviews. Uh, the next steps, and I promise we do have the same video after this and so we can keep watching traffic. <laughs> Uh, in August, we approved our plan, and uh, in January, Caltrans essentially revalidated it uh, through their own process, and they did what's called the Project Study Report, the Project Initiation Document, and that allowed it to move into the next phase, which is getting funding from the California State uh, Transportation Commission. So Caltrans and Tansy worked with the CTC to uh, get the money here, throw some acronyms at it. And that uh, funding allocation happened in March last month, and that means that the new fiscal year we'll have our, uh, our funding to go out and do our initial design work and our initial environmental document. And the environmental impact report is another chance to have more public input, more comments, and a much more detailed analysis than our planning level study was. And when that's done in uh, you know, two to three year time frame, uh, it's a big document, it's a big road to tackle. Uh, we could start collecting, uh, or start uh, construction, because during this whole time we're collecting our, our revenue from TAMSI's Measure X and also Senate Bill 1. So uh, while we're doing our studies, we're collecting our pennies, and then we should be good to go for construction in a couple of years. And with that, we can take questions. And uh, we've got a video going to. I'll come around with the microphone so it's on our recording. Please. <clears throat> Thank you, Hector. Hello. I like the turnabout, but is there any criteria which governs how close two roundabouts could be? Because I see on Highway 68, we have Correo de Tierra, we have San Benicio. They are very, very close. And anyway, that's the question. Is there a criteria that governs it? That's a great question. Um, and actually, if you notice the roundabout up at Holman Highway, there's a teardrop, which started out as a little mini roundabout, but there's a teardrop right at the um, Pebble Beach entrance. And that serves as the same purpose of slowing traffic down, creates the same yield condition. And that roundabout's 80 feet away from the major roundabout. The, the entire roundabout solution is driven by geometry. It's all about getting the speeds, the deflection angle, angles, and the view angles correct so that you get the right speed, the right interaction, and the good choices from the drivers. So creating that setting is what it's all based on. For these intersections here, the spacing is not as much of a, an issue. Um, especially at Corral and San Ignacio. At those two locations, we're really looking for an operational solution where if you're driving from Salinas toward Corral, go through San Ignacio and Corral, there's a two-lane approach. If you want to make a left on Corral, you go around the roundabout and you head up. If you don't want to go and make that left, you just stay straight and cruise on back down the highway. Creating that really unimpeded left turn gives you really exceptional access and it creates lots of gaps for folks to turn out of Corral and make a right or go into the roundabout and make a left. It's very, very cooperative. The gap for entering the roundabout is short. And what I mean by gap is the distance between two cars coming toward from the concert. Let's say I'm in the roundabout and I'm looking to the left, there's two cars coming at me, and I need a gap that's about this big to fit in between them as I go into the roundabout. Well, with a traffic signal, the speeds are far higher, so the gap is much, much longer. I have to have a much larger acceptable gap to make that turn, or I have to have, to have full control by the signal and stop everybody else before I make a left turn. Every signal, Whenever I have a left turn, that's just about the only movement that can go through the intersection, is that left turn. It's very, very, um, um, it just consumes so much more of the time, it's not very efficient. So, 
spacing is not as much of a problem. But I will follow on to where we will have spacing concerns because I want you to understand very clearly where we have some limitations. Um, at Laurel is great. We've got the fire station on the corner. And just to the west of that fire station is this little road called Seca Place. Now, I want to beat up on the planner, whoever left that access <laughs> thing right, right there. But we're stuck with it. So I have to find a way to make this roundabout work and not completely close off Seca, Seca Place, which will be very challenging. I don't have a solution for that. So there are some spacing things that are going to be challenging. There's another one at, um, what's one with two houses? That's the same thing too. San Antonio has these two beautiful homes, you know, on the monument side of Highway 60. I'd like to take a bulldozer and just go right through all those. <laughs> but they're there, and I have to figure out a way to get that thing to work. If I can't get that geometry to work, we probably won't build that signal, or that roundabout. We'll probably find a signal solution. Again, we're not trying to force something to work. We want to have better control of the intersection. So whichever one works better. Well, I'm convinced. I live on 68. So my question is, uh, you think construction might start, say, in 2020. Have you got any sort of construction plan? Will you start from the Monterey end and build them sequentially? Are you going to build multiple roundabouts at the same time? Will most of the work be done at night? I mean, what's the plan for construction? Uh, so. Was everybody around, everybody drive through that Pullman Highway intersection we were building in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, was it horrible? It was perfect. It was perfect. See, wasn't it great? Why was it great? Because I closed ramps and I did all kinds of crazy things with traffic. The reason it was great is because we had Grant doing the outreach and we told everybody, everybody before we started, it's gonna take me a year, there's going to be three periods where I have to do something really hard and divert people and do horrible detours. <coughs> One nine time detour, I think we sent people to Big Sur. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what it felt like to some people. But we let everybody know what was coming so they could plan and either avoid it or have enough time to deal with it. And we confined those time periods to short periods that would, number one, it would make it easier for you to plan so you would go, okay, it's only for a week. Or um, it would save an enormous amount of construction time instead of spreading it out over a month or two. We're going to do the same thing with this. We're going to make those signals run well for most of the time. And then where there's a deep impact, we'll try and keep it to the shortest amount of time possible. We use night work. We can do double shifts, all kinds of things, and keep those detours you know, as short as possible and let people know what's coming. Because if you have the information and you know what's going to happen, it makes it easier to adjust and do life a little more successfully. So the same thing's going to happen here. We probably are not going to build them one at a time in a sequence where we have construction for 10 years. We're going to take a grouping of them, probably three at a time, and we'll work with um, staging the traffic control so it makes sense and has the least impact for the most number of people. And we'll make things run the best way we can. We will most likely be doing a lot of night work um, when it comes to shutting down one side of the road or the other side, because we want to make sure we can get um, the work done in a really, um, a really uh, high quality manner. So the most area we have for paving, we try and do that. But at the same time, we don't want to shut the road down. So that's that's our plan of attack. Um, which three we'll do first or second really is going to depend on who's suing us. <laughs> so we'll be able to start sooner if we are able to get through the lawsuits quicker. <laughs> Signage seems to be a question too because when you're a destination, the locals will know how to navigate through, but the, the people who are visiting will not know which turn. And I know GPS is going to tell you first, second, or third turn. Um, a lot of times it just confuses people. So do you have an answer for that or is that under study? Yes, that's a really good point. This, uh, there were four major things when we did our first roundabout here um, that were huge. They were design showstoppers for me. And having good guide signing 
was up there in the top four. So we actually looked at what does the driver need, what's the information they need, and when exactly do they need it. So they can, number one, know what's coming up, what lane to be in, and then when to make that move, whatever it is. And that's what our, we learned a lot on that project, so that's what we're gonna follow. We're gonna do the same type of thing to make it simple, make the message um, consecutive so you can track it easily, and um, we're gonna design it so you don't need a GPS to drive the roundabout. You'll know. Thank you. Yeah, right? Uh, that actually covers more or less the same question. I really like the ride a lot. I have a lot of experience with the roundabouts, and I think they're sensational. But there is a problem with this one. You may not have been able to deal with it, and that is it's not a pure spoke system where all the roads radiate directly from the center of the intersection. Uh, even though I've had experience, and I know that area very well, it's always sort of problematical. My wife has the same experience. Did you give any attempt to try to make it pure radiating geometry, or they're just, you just couldn't do it in that location? We actually did um, attempt to do kind of a spoke type of thing, more radio. Um, in 2005, the first roundabout alternative came through, and it basically failed um, because the distance between the spokes was so short. When you're in the roundabout, you couldn't tell which leg, the first spoke or the second one, you had to take to get onto the southbound exit ramp. Uh, this one had a few other challenges, which was, uh, gosh, the right away was, you know, very, very <coughs> limited. We just shoehorned that thing in there. There's also a 20 foot grade difference between the highway and Pebble Beach down below. There was a queuing distance from the um, Pebble Beach entry gate up to <coughs> Highway 68, and we wanted to maximize that length so that that queuing wouldn't block the roundabout, and we want to make sure Pebble Beach was able to collect their 1025. <laughs> <laughs> Getting in at a time was very important. <laughs> so having that big swooping approach gave me more distance for that queuing and that's why we had that other thing plus it was through an endangered pine forest we had drainage into the Pescadero Creek and Pebble Beach and the Majors Creek in Monterey we had the endangered pine forest we had the coastal commission is in the coastal zone and it was the only access way for the hospital so we had a lot of pieces that had to come together and it was really really challenging these, fortunately, don't have nearly that kind of complexity because they're basically right angle intersections. Um, the one that will be challenging will be San Benicio because I got a bridge that goes right up to the intersection and I don't want to rebuild the bridge because that will blow the budget. Okay. Um, Ms. Avila, grew up with roundabouts on an old Ford. I've been in your, in your office many times in the last few years begging for a roundabout in the where Glenwood Circle and Villa Bandera and the Hilton come to Aguajito because the exit mm -hmm. I live in Glenwood Circle and I get stuck there forever and ever because people are coming out of NBC and that is terrible. But since a roundabout is I don't know if it's in the plans or not, there is one stop sign you could put and I can show again where uh, that is in your office where the people who are coming out of NPC and are going to take Highway 1 South from Aguajito actually don't have to stop us and we could go around but there's already a little square thing we could go around. So I beg you please to look into that. Thank you. That's a great location and a good suggestion for roundabout. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, good suggestion. Where I, I'm going to try for one more question, possibly two. Um, first. I want to say thank you for the really beautiful job you did of putting this one together. Um, I was skeptical. <laughs> one of my sons is a local paramedic, and I was deeply he was deeply concerned because one of his shifts happens to be Big Sur and uh, how he would get there, and it was no more of a problem than it already was. So that's wonderful. So that's my question about the. Uh, 68 corridor roundabouts, how will the emergency vehicles be uh, able to get through um, during the, 
especially if you're doing several at a time? That's a great question, and it comes up a lot. You know, before we built our roundabout up here, our, one of our biggest skeptics was uh, CHP and local fire departments. Mm -hmm. Uh, because there was a fear that there would be so much delay and people wouldn't get out of the way and other sorts of things. <laughs> right. Um, I'd say our biggest critic was really the Monica Herald. <laughs> 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 the, the, fear, the fear from CHP was, gosh, you know, we've got AT&T Pro-Am, the US Open, the Concourse Weekend, how are we going to have enough officers to control this intersection? And I told them, don't put anybody out there. You don't need anybody because it does it itself. It's self-regulating. And the same thing happens with an emergency vehicle approach. Lights and sirens, you move, move over to the side. Actually, the most difficult thing is for folks to get off the limit line and get into the circle because there's a big, giant truck apron that the fire truck goes over and it just goes right around. Oh, that's what that's for. Yeah, uh -huh. it's for emergency vehicles and really large trucks. So they just drive right over it, drive right around, okay. and they have fewer side impacts from drivers who are playing their radio too loud, and they don't see the fire truck, and then they drive through and they get a T-bone crash. That's the number one crash for emergency vehicles. Um, it's also faster for ambulances, because ambulances are required to stop at a signal that's red. So they gotta stop. Make sure it's clear, and then you go. you've seen them slow down. They don't climb. But anyways, the roundabouts actually work a lot better for emergency vehicles, especially because there's no queue. Uh, um, I've lived in Europe and worked there, and have driven a lot in Europe, and I love roundabouts. But I noticed that in the past ten years or so, they started putting signals on them. So have your studies? included at what point you might have to put signals on the roundabouts? <clears throat> That's a great question too. There are um, a lot of discussions now with the Transportation Research Board, NDC, and FHWA for signalizing roundabouts. Um, and I actually sit on one of those committees. The, the issue is what do you do with um, ADA access for crossing a roundabout? So blind person, person in a wheelchair, and you've got a two-lane approach to a roundabout and a crosswalk. How does that person get across there? And um, it's a challenging topic because the geometry is different in every single one. It's easy to signal because the signal, you go to the corner, you hit the button, and you'll hit the beep, and you walk across. But roundabouts aren't square. And so there's a lot of discussion on that kind of a thing of do we have a button where we have signals and they stop and lay across, and they're not very close on solutions. There are solutions that work, but they don't work universally yet. There are also high volume roundabouts where there is um, major congestion that exceeds the capacity of the roundabout, where agencies have signalized the approach to create gaps in roundabout traffic that clear one direction or another. They tend to be a little peaky also. And then there's also signal solutions for uh, rail lines that go through the center of a roundabout. So you basically stop the approaches and yeah, put your penny on the track and run back. <laughs> Well, typically our discussions of traffic are not quite so entertaining as they were today. And I'm sure it's because of our pre presenters who are both so knowledgeable and, you know, the Holman Highway Roundabout has received numerous awards and, you know, in large part it's because Rich was the designer. So we're very fortunate to have had you today and thank you very much.